Well, good afternoon to the World Hemp Congress. My name is Russ Belville. I'm the executive director of 420 Radio, which is live 24-hour marijuana legalization talk radio. So I hope it's clear for everyone that... Thank you, thank you. I just want to make it clear to everyone that I'm, I'm not a, a medical doctor or a scientist in any way, but in my job, I interview some of the leading medical doctors and scientists on the issue of medical cannabis here in the United States. So I'm hoping today that uh, I can bring you some of their expertise and wisdom. Uh, my talk today isn't so much on the uh, medical application of cannabis, and I'm hoping that there are other speakers who have addressed that. Some of the, uh, you know, amazing applications we're finding for things like multiple sclerosis or uh, Parkinson's disease or post-traumatic stress. These are some amazing developments, and I'm going to leave it to the scientists and the doctors to talk more in depth about those. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the the politics and the laws that are being passed and what some of the trends and uh, some of the uh, the future of medical marijuana here in this country. So uh, I hope everybody understands that perspective. Uh, I am, uh, as I mentioned, in Oregon. I'm on the west coast of the United States where the medical marijuana movement pretty much uh, began. Uh, began in 1996 with uh, California passing its Proposition 215. This was a citizen initiative that allowed the people to put forth a, uh, a petition, how it gets signatures, and place it on the ballot. And I would say for uh, the European audience, that's the first thing to understand in medical marijuana politics here in the United States is that in the United States, we have, uh, you know, state by state, we're passing these laws and it depends a lot on on the constitutions of each individual state. And the first division between the medical marijuana states would be the, d the division between those states that have passed medical marijuana through ballot initiative versus those that have had to pass it through their legislatures. Uh, in the United States, there are 26 of our 50 states that have the power of the ballot initiative at some level. Uh, most of them have the power to just go ahead and directly put a ballot uh, a petition together and get something on uh, in, in the election ballot. Others uh, have the power of referendum where uh, the legislature has to put together the bill, but then the legislature puts it on the ballot for the people to decide. Uh, most of the first medical marijuana states that passed their uh, legislation passed it through the ballot initiative process. Without this ballot initiative process, the development of medical marijuana in the United States would have taken far, far longer. As you may be aware, uh, marijuana, hemp, cannabis is what we call a Schedule One drug in this country, a drug that has no medical uses, has no safety under medical use, and is highly abusable and dangerous. Of course, cannabis doesn't belong in that category whatsoever, but that's the category that we found found ourselves uh, trapped in, uh, in that it's completely illegal under the uh, federal laws and has no medical use. If the people of California weren't able to put together that ballot initiative, uh, it would have been a lot longer before some legislature would have been brave enough to take this up and directly confront the federal government. So uh, as these medical marijuana laws passed, there were a lot of uh, differences uh, between uh, the laws that were passed by the initiative states versus the more recent laws that have been passed by legislatures where the people don't have the power of initiative. A and generally speaking, the initiative states are on the western side of the United States and the non-initiative sides uh, states are on the eastern side of the United States, with a, with a few exceptions, but generally it's a western versus eastern phenomenon. And because of this phenomenon, what we've had happen is we've had a, a difference in what medical marijuana will cover and in how uh, liberal those medical marijuana laws are. And I have a chart here for you. I'm not sure how well this will turn out through Skype. But I'll, I'll present this and I'll talk through it at least so if you can't see it as well, uh, we can at least still understand what's going on. And this, uh, the first thing that we like to look at here is what a, a concept that I call healthy enough to imprison. And 
this is one of the things that always vexes me about a medical marijuana law is it in a in a sense it says that some people are sick enough to allow to use cannabis but the rest of them are healthy enough to imprison and so we'll take you through a look at this and what we're going to do is we're going to compare the medical marijuana laws state by state in the united states based on how high a hurdle one has to clear in order to not be busted in order to not be arrested not be hassled by law enforcement so along the left edge of this graph i've created uh basically an increasing list of conditions that are more and more difficult to com to uh to fall under at the very bottom we'll have things like enhancement or mental wellness or general pain but these are the things that would be easiest to qualify for because uh, these are things that the, the patient himself or herself would uh, admit to. Uh, as we get further up the list, we get mental illness, chronic conditions like pain and nausea, lifelong debilitation like glaucoma, seizures or spasms, terminal illnesses like cancer, AIDS or cachexia, all the way to the top, death. Literally on your deathbed, if you're on your deathbed, we'll let you have medical cannabis. And as time has gone on, the hurdles one has to clear in order to qualify for this medical protection have gotten higher. We'll start in 1996. In 1996, California passed its medical marijuana law, and it made it to the point where anxiety, depression, mental wellness, pretty much anything that a doctor believed would qualify uh, for medical marijuana, anything a doctor thought was a reasonable uh, condition. But as time went on, 1998, as the 90s passed, the next few states, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Maine, Hawaii, Nevada, Colorado, all passed laws that required a specific condition list. California's law is unique in that it allows doctors to make the decision as to what they will recommend cannabis for. And this fits along pretty much with the way medicine works in this country. In fact, about one out of five prescriptions in the United States is for what we call an off-label use of a drug. That is, a drug being prescribed for something that our Food and Drug Administration did not approve it for. But with cannabis, since 1998, in Washington and Oregon started this, there have been conditionless a specific list of diseases or conditions for which you can get medical marijuana and no other. You cannot qualify in, say, Washington State if you have post-traumatic stress disorder. In Vermont, you cannot qualify if you have glaucoma, which is covered in just about every other state. In New Jersey or the District of Columbia, you pretty much have to have cancer, AIDS, or cachexia before you're going to be able to qualify for medical cannabis. So over time, these qualifi qualifi qualifications have become more difficult for people to qualify under because each state, as it has passed medical marijuana, has sought to tighten these restrictions. And the goal of tightening these restrictions is to make sure healthy people aren't sneaking into the program. Now, another, another situation for which these medical marijuana laws have changed is in how much access to marijuana are the patients allowed to have? How much cannabis can a medical marijuana patient have before the law starts to consider him uh, to have too much, to be potentially diverting it to healthy people or to the black market? And again, we'll set this up like a, a series of steps where at uh, the top, we have the greatest access available. People in the states at the top have the maximum access. They can have over 12 ounces of cannabis. Uh, they can have uh, dispensaries at which they can purchase cannabis. They can grow their own cannabis at home. Maximum access would allow them to have as much cannabis pretty much as they would, as they would need. And as we move down this left-hand access, we'll get lesser and lesser access. Some access where they only have three to six ounces, but they can only get it from a dispensary. Or maybe they only get one or two ounces. Or maybe they get no access whatsoever. Any possession is illegal. So on this scale, as time has gone on, the medical marijuana states have also become more and more restrictive. We start with California, where a doctor can recommend as much marijuana as a person may need. Washington, Oregon, and Alaska then restricted that to three to six ounces or 
one to two ounces. Maine, Hawaii, Nevada, Colorado in the 2000s, all between one to six ounces. Vermont, Montana, one to two ounces. Rhode Island, one to two ounces. And again, as these states pass their laws, most of them start to restrict patient access to medical cannabis. New Jersey, Arizona, District of Columbia. Now, there have been some positive changes in this regard. You may have noticed how all the way to the left in 1998, the Washington and Oregon that were originally three to six ounces raised to the point now where they are 15 ounces for Washington, 24 ounces for Oregon. But again, these are both states in the West, both states that have the ballot initiative power. These states in the East, like Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, are all being very, very restrictive about how much cannabis a medical cannabis patient can use, again, for their fear that it's going to be distributed to the black market, to the healthy people. And nowhere does this show up more severely than when we look at the ability of patients to be able to grow their own medicine. This graph that we're showing right now that I call the death of home grow is a comparison of all the current medical marijuana states and a couple that are pending and how much marijuana they will allow you to grow at your own home as a patient. The dark green bars represent mature plants, plants that will you know, pr be producing buds, be producing medicine, and the light green bars represent seedlings, how many clones or seedling plants one may have. And again, this is something that varies between about six plants for some of the, some of the states, maybe a dozen for some of the other states. But notice how once we hit 2010 and the state of Arizona, since then, no home grow. That would be Arizona, District of Columbia, New Jersey, Delaware, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, and most recently, Illinois and New Hampshire, where patients aren't allowed to grow a single marijuana plant. They must, must purchase their marijuana through a series of dispensaries, most of which are some level of a state-run program. So what we have here is a situation where medical marijuana in the West is increasingly becoming a dispensary-only situation. It's increasingly becoming a situation where patients are required to purchase from a dispensary and in many cases required to purchase from a specific dispensary. A patient must register with this one outlet and then uh, that's the only place they can go. In the case of places like Illinois, patients will even be tracked down to the gram per every fortnight, for every two weeks, exactly how much marijuana they've purchased, which will be kept on a magnetic striped card to ensure that no patient is possibly getting more than his or her two ounces in that two-week period. So this is the trend in uh, medical marijuana legislation. Uh, to be increasingly restrictive, to increasingly take the power of cultivating plants away from the patients and giving it only to business interests that are generally very, very hard to qualify for. Uh, for example, in the most recent uh, states that have passed these dispensary laws, uh, Connecticut is one of them. I was reading a story the other day of how the applicants to run a dispensary in the state of Connecticut <laughs> must have two million dollars in escrow must have two million dollars just in the bank sitting there before they can even think of applying to be a dispensary when they turn in their application for a dispensary it must come with a seventy five thousand dollar application fee other states have application fees that are five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars that are non-refundable in the state of Massachusetts, the law there has indicated there may be five dispensaries per county. There's five counties in the state, there, or seven counties in the state, pardon me. Therefore, there can be a total of 35 dispensaries. Over 100 entities have applied to be one of these 35 dispensaries, each of them spending $5,000 or more in non-refundable fees that the state gets to, uh, gets to recoup just for the privilege of applying. So what we have in, in America, in my opinion, 
is a, a dire situation when it comes to medical cannabis, at least in the states that don't have the initiative power. The trends that I see tend to make me think medical cannabis is a box canyon. It is a, a, a trap in a sense where people who wish to use cannabis for its full potential as hemp, as a recreational item, are going to be trapped in this pharmaceuticalization of cannabis. We're going to be trapped into this idea that cannabis is this incredibly powerful drug and it's only for the sickest of the sick and it can only be used if it's heavily controlled and severely monitored and heavily surveilled. And if we buy into this idea, and if we get locked into this idea, it's only a matter of time before pharmaceutical companies like GW Pharmaceuticals perfect their sprays like Sativex, which I know in Europe has, has been approved in many countries. It's in phase three clinical trials here in the United States. They'll perfect Sativex sprays. They'll perfect inhalers. They will perfect all sorts of methods of delivering cannabinoid therapies that do not involve the whole plant. And once they've successfully separated the medicine from the whole plant, they will then be able to put in those dispensaries these cannabinoid pharmaceuticals instead of the whole plants. And since the people in those states have been locked into a dispensary system and been forbidden to grow their own plants, they will be trapped in that dispensary system and forced to use the cannabinoid pharmaceuticals that will then be paid for by insurance. So I feel it is of paramount importance to reformers in the United States and worldwide to, to uh, indicate just how important the right to growing our own plants is. Only through being able to grow our own cannabis plants do we have the leverage against corporations or governments that would seek to control that plant, over charges for that plant, provide us uh, substandard plants, only if we have this right to home grow, do we have the power to help determine how medical cannabis proceeds from this point forward? Thank you for having me here for the World Hemp Congress. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Thank you very much, Russ. Um, how many countries in the United States uh, have free, uh, free in we have we now have 20 states and our federal district the district of columbia which recognize medical marijuana to one level or another how does this look out is this um hospital is this normal is it your hospital or hospital how how did how function how it is functional well uh Hospitals, by and large, in any state, whether it's a medical marijuana state or not, are not going to tolerate the use of cannabis within their hospital. There may be some rare exceptions, but generally, hospitals in the United States aren't going to tolerate it. Um, there may be individual doctors or nurses or staff at the hospital who might look the other way, who might purposefully ignore it. But generally speaking, cannabis, is in, is forbid, cannabis use is forbidden in most hospitals, and that has to do with the fact that most hospitals have some degree of interface with the federal government. They'll have some sort of federal contract or federal grant, and then the federal government will use that as leverage to, to kind of extort these hospitals into not allowing cannabis use. Um, hello, I am Pramila, and I have a question for you. And actually, uh, thank you for um, creating this radio station and thank you for creating awareness thank you. for uh, the world in the West and also now the world in the East, which can look up to a radio station like this, which is actually talking about uh, legalization and promotion of activities, which uh, uh, is possibly uh, heading us towards the... Um, war on drugs and war on uh, climate change and war on uh, uh, making humanity into a, a small box, you know, so thank you for that. But my question uh, is, to, uh, is if you, for you in India, when you look at uh, the historical use of cannabis, uh, there is a spiritual side to it, there is, uh, there is also a medical side to it and uh, of course the benefits that the plant can provide to the people. What would you suggest is the way that we should look? Because generally, East is looking to the West, 
and I'm glad I find people from the West looking to the East too. Well, so, um, this combination, how would you help us, uh, I mean, uh, bring together maybe such a radio station, legislation, uh, various things in India, because when India makes a move, I think there will be a move. <laughs> well, thank you for your question, and uh, I, I appreciate the uh, compliment as far as 420 Radio goes. Uh, 420radio.org, uh, we cover not just the United States, we're also covering uh, worldwide cannabis prohibition. We have a show from Britain, and we have a show from Spain, and if you'd like, I'd love to have a show from India, so uh, you can hit me up uh, on 420radio.org. Contact me if you'd like. <laughs> Uh, 420 radio and bring awareness uh, in maybe so many regional languages uh, that we have. It would be great. Excellent. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's absolutely, yeah. The, this service that I've set up with 420 radio is uh, completely, it, it's a service. That, that my idea was that, you know, I, I was flipping through the TV channels, you know, and I see there's a golf channel and there's a sports channel. And I figured, why couldn't there be a channel about marijuana legalization, about cannabis science, about medical marijuana, industrial hemp? And I've opened this up to everyone. So, yes, anyone listening, if you'd like to have a show, if you'd like to get your word out to the United States and to the world uh, through m multiple platforms, we're on Ustream, YouTube, uh, iTunes, many platforms, uh, please just go to 420radio.org. There's a contact form and uh we'd love to help you out now as far as uh what directions should we go uh this is interesting i'm glad you brought up the spiritual aspect too because there are people here in the united states that are fighting that battle as well uh, a famous uh practitioner is by, goes by the name of roger christie he's currently uh spent he's been in jail for three years now awaiting trial for his participation in what he calls the hawaiian cannabis ministry and he's he's a it's a Christian sect that believes that cannabis uh, was the holy anointing oil of Christ. And so they take cannabis as a sacrament. And this has been an interesting, uh, interesting fight, because in the United States, of course, under our Constitution, we have a First Amendment. And our First Amendment says that Congress shall neither respect uh, nor establish religion. Basically, the government's supposed to be neutral with respect to religion. And the only time government can uh, uh, stop a religion from doing something is if it has what the courts call a compelling interest to do so. So for a silly example, uh, Satanists can't sacrifice virgins because the government has a, a compelling interest to stop murder. Okay, so the, the murder outranks your religious freedom to sacrifice virgins. Okay, uh, well... The Hawaiian Cannabis Ministry says, well, we use cannabis as our sacrament, and the government has said, well, we have a compelling interest to stop people from using cannabis, so you can't do that. And what makes this case even more interesting is in 1993, our President Clinton, what was it 96? Well, it was in the, in the 90s. President Clinton signed a law called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and the purpose of the law was to protect the religious rights of religious minorities. This was used successfully by some of our, uh, our aboriginal populations here in America, some of our Native, uh, Native Americans, and by some members of a Brazilian uh, religion to be able to use some powerful hallucinogenic drugs uh, known as peyote, uh, peyote cactus, uh, uh, heavy-duty hallucinogen, and ayahuasca, which is a kind of a hallucinogenic tea. These two religions won their case. They were able to show the government that their use of these drugs was a sacrament and the government shouldn't stop them, and they won. Now, the Hawaiian Cannabis Ministry is trying to say the same thing. Cannabis is our sacrament, and we should be able to use it. But the difference our government has found, and, and I, I don't mean to be too flip or sarcastic or dismissive about this, but our government has actually decided that cannabis is too popular. And therefore, it can't be a religious sacrament. It's a strange bit of logic, but I'll work it through with you. In the case of the Indians that are using the hallucinogens, there isn't really a whole big market in these hallucinogens. First of all, when you take peyote or ayahuasca, you will vomit. It's not pleasant. It, you will vomit because of it. And then after you vomit, you have the hallucinogenic trip that they think, you, think of as the sacrament. And so our government has decided that 
if we let Indians use these drugs, it's not really going to cause a big upswing. Uh, it's not going to cause a big increase in the use of these drugs because they make you puke and they're not fun and they're very difficult to get a hold of and so on. But if the government decided cannabis was okay as a sacrament, there would suddenly be 26 million newly religious people in the United States because cannabis is very popular. So our federal government has said, well, we can't let your church use cannabis because if we did, every pot smoker in America would join your church and then there's no way we could stop people from smoking pot. So it's a strange situation, but as far as the religious angle goes, our government has decided that cannabis is too popular a sacrament to protect. And that, to me, is just offensive uh, on a number of levels. So which direction should Europe and India and other countries go? All of them. We're fighting it on the religious front. We're fighting it on the medical front. We're fighting it for industrial hemp. And we're fighting it from a recreational front. I don't think you have to choose just one way of fighting for this. But my personal preference would be fighting for the recreational. And the reason why is until we end the demonization of people that are just using it for fun, we are forced to have to separate them from the sick people or the religious people or the hemp people. If we allow the pot smoker to smoke their pot for fun, then there's no controversy over medical use or industrial use or religious use. So I guess that's my long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Dean and I have uh, one question. Uh, talking about uh, medical cannabis, we are talking about part of plants that uh, have uh, these uh, cannabinoids. So, uh, this medical marijuana, that means that they can use marijuana in a raw form? Or is it possible also to produce uh, oil, uh, I don't know, make some cakes, uh, uh, drinks uh, out of it? or just in a raw form? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, the medical cannabis laws that have passed in the United States so far all deal with the raw form of cannabis, that people are allowed to have the raw plant material, and then with that plant material, uh, they can manufacture just about any, you know, uh, uh, edibles, like, you know, the pot brownie that everyone thinks of, or cookies. Uh, they can make drinks, they can make tinctures, they can use it in vaporization, in smoking, and so on. However, uh, most recently, the people who are against medical marijuana and, and who are just against cannabis in general in this country, they've kind of realized that they're losing. In the United States currently, the latest poll shows that 4%, 4% of our population thinks we're winning the war on drugs. 80%, 4 out of 5 people, 80% in this country support medical marijuana. So to oppose medical marijuana now is kind of seen as a losing battle. And most recently, we had a fantastic documentary on our uh, cable news, uh, CNN, where a very respected physician named Dr. Sanjay Gupta came out in favor of medical cannabis. And part of his uh, documentary showed a young three-year-old girl suffering seizures uh, who was able to treat her seizures with a, uh, an extract rich in cannabidiol, the CBD and very low in THC, which, of course, uh, Dr. Gupta points out is the part that gets you high. So lately, the, the anti-medical marijuana people have seized on that, that CBD extract that doesn't get you high, and their talking point now is that, well, we shouldn't be giving people this whole plant that's crude, and we don't know how much this and how much that, and is it going to work or whatever. Instead, we should synthesize this plant and, and extract out of it the CBD and extract out of it the THC and make all sorts of uh, tinctures and potions and, and things that we know the guaranteed quantities of and and so forth so that's been the push now is to push us away from the whole plant and push us into you know synthesized versions of its constituents and that fits along with what i was telling you about you know uh the states aren't letting people grow their own plants the idea here is to push us away from the whole plant because we can grow that ourselves and it's cheap 
into pushing us to these synthesized versions that have to be made by a pharmaceutical company that can mark it up a thousand percent and make a profit off it. To me, the most scary thing about medical marijuana to the mainstream isn't the fact that it's marijuana. It's the fact that it's a plant that we can grow it ourselves and cut out the middleman and all that pharmaceutical and, and, uh, and medical for-profit industry. That's what terrifies them is us cutting them out of medicine for profit. Okay, and, and then uh, the next question uh, related to this one. What kind of uh, usage of medical marijuana would you prefer or your, would you recommend? Uh, do you mean which delivery method, which, like smoking? Or? Oil or raw? Um, oh, okay, okay. Well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's something that's going to vary depending on the patient. Uh, I think the most effective method of medical cannabis use is vaporization. Uh, vaporization provides the immediate relief that a patient needs, especially if we're talking about a patient with, uh, with nausea. If, if someone is violently vomiting, it's a little much to ask them to swallow a pill. So to me, the, the, their ability to be able to vaporize, have that immediate relief without all of the smoke and all of the harm that smoke causes, I think vaporization is a very superior way of using medical cannabis. Uh, for children, uh, a lot of the people that use it for children uh, find that baking it into an edible item is the best way, uh, into a cookie or a brownie or something. Uh, because just the idea of a child smoking or, or vaporizing uh, can be a little disconcerting to some people. And then, okay, another question related to uh, children use of the medical cannabis. I know uh, one, one friend of mine had the... She had the son, and uh, he died at age three, something like that, because of the tumor. And uh, she could not get any, for example, hash oil or hemp oil any, anywhere, because they told you, okay, under seven years, we don't uh, recommend to use that. Is right. it, are there any uh, scientific researches related that uh, also children in age two or three can use this kind of uh, medical economy? Cannabis instead of, I don't know, chemotherapy and so on. Right. Um, well, first, on the medical research front, uh, very little, if any, research on medical cannabis use by children. Um, since cannabis in America is still a Schedule I drug, it makes it near impossible for researchers to get a hold of any for legitimate research. Cannabis is the only drug in the United States for which the entire supply is run by the federal government and there's only one source. To be able to get any of that cannabis to study, you have to go through the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. And the only studies they tend to give the green light to are studies that find the harm of cannabis, not studies that are designed to find the benefits of cannabis. Which kind of makes sense. They're, they're a group that's, prom that's against drug abuse, so they're going to fund studies having to do with drug abuse abuse they don't think of it as medical in fact as far as the federal government's concerned there is no such thing as medical marijuana so on the science side on the study side we don't have much but anecdotally i can tell you personally i know of three children i've interviewed their parents uh who have benefited amazingly from medical cannabis one is a little girl whose name is um uh, michaela comstock she's suffering from leukemia and she's been using cannabis oil to deal with the leukemia and the chemotherapy treatments. And thanks to both chemo and her cannabis, she is now cancer-free. Uh, we have another child whose name is Alex Eccles. Alex Eccles suffers from a severe form of autism that causes rage. And it causes this little boy to uh, put his head through walls, to beat himself with his own hands until he's bloody. Uh, and his father used medical cannabis for him and the child became mellow and attentive and stopped hitting himself. Uh, we have another child in the CNN documentary, Charlotte Figi, who severe epilep epileptic was having up to 300 seizures a week. They gave her some medical cannabis. Now she has maybe one seizure per week. 
So anecdotally, we've seen plenty as far as how medical cannabis uh, can help children. And uh, this, I, I think this is also becoming one of the uh, main reasons more people are opening up to medical cannabis. Because uh, when you see a child who is suffering, you have to be a monster not to want to see that child get better. And when people see with their own two eyes a kid eat a cannabis brownie and then miraculously recover, it opens up their minds a lot. But we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, in most of the medical cannabis states, there are provisions to allow children to use medical cannabis. But as you noted, doctors are very reluctant to want to be the one who recommends for the child. You know, nobody want, no doctor wants to say, hey, you're the doctor that gives pot to kids. You know, they, they don't want to have that stigma associated with them. And it's gotten so bad in the state of New Jersey, where there's another little girl who's very much like Charlotte, who has this severe uh, epilepsy. In the state of New Jersey, when they passed their law, the governor there was so against medical cannabis and so afraid uh, of its use by children that in order to qualify for medical cannabis use in New Jersey for a child, not only does the child's doctor have to approve it, but you have to get a second opinion from a psychiatrist and a third opinion from a pediatrician. This is the only place in America I can think where you need three doctors to agree before you can move ahead with a treatment. And the problem is, in New Jersey, these doctors all have to register with the state if they're recommending medical marijuana. And to date, there are only two pediatricians in a state of nine million people who are even registered to recommend medical cannabis and neither one of them have so there's a lot of work to do to help these kids out uh and um i sure hope that we do thank you i um back from india i have another question for you and first one is how do you fund such a radio station and second what do you think right now about uruguay making this one giant leap uh, towards the legalization for various uses, recreational industrial. Okay. Uh, I have many more questions, but I will um, let you answer. <laughs> okay. Well, to find 420 Radio, just go to 420radio.org. And that's the main place to find us. Uh, when we say it's radio, it's internet radio. So you won't find it on any terrestrial airwaves. It's only on the internet. But 420radio.org. Or you can go to an application that's called TuneIn. T-U-N-E-I-N, tune in. It's a radio application, and if you search for 420 Radio there, you'll find us. You could also go to iTunes or to YouTube and search for 420 Radio, and you'll find us there as well. Now, as far as Uruguay, um, Uruguay may be the best news I've had all year. <laughs> yeah, it, it's... Uh, And Portugal the year before that. <laughs> so between Portugal and Uruguay, I'm a very happy, happy activist. Um, of course, if you don't know, Uruguay's um, legislature has moved uh, to legalize marijuana, not just medical, not just spiritual, any use of marijuana, make it legal, have a state run market, which is significant in that other countries have decriminalized marijuana. They've made it so that getting caught with it won't be a crime, but you might get a fine. You might get a slap on the wrist. Even the Netherlands, where they tolerate the sales of marijuana in coffee shops, hasn't legalized marijuana. You can still technically be arrested for it, and if you're growing it or producing too much of it or selling too much of it, there are still serious crimes in the Netherlands. But in, in Uruguay, we are talking about legalizing the adult personal use of marijuana, legalizing the sales and production of marijuana as well. This, is, uh, this has been an amazing uh, watershed moment as far as the politics go here in the hemisphere. Uh, in addition to Uruguay making this move, we've seen the Organization of American States, which comprises most of the Americas, South America, Central America, uh, and, and North America, uh, the Organization of American States has come out and called for uh, more sane uh, marijuana laws and, and a look to the ending of the drug war. And the reason being is that these South American and Central American countries, they suffer the results of American drug consumption. America is the largest consumer of drugs on the planet, 
And all those drugs are coming through Colombia and Guatemala and Honduras and Mexico. And thousands and thousands of people are dying over this every year. In Mexico alone, 15,000 murders this year over the, the trafficking of drugs. So this move by Uruguay and these Latin American countries uh, to seek an alternative to all this death and destruction is certainly a, 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 a groundbreaking move here in the Western Hemisphere. And it's creating a lot of political pressure on the United States to also review its policies. We've seen the United States make some noise lately about reviewing our mass incarceration. We have 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's prisoners. We have more people incarcerated in America per capita. And overall, we have 2.3 million prisoners. China has 1.6 million. And they have a billion more people than we do. America's got a severe incarceration problem, and most of it, almost ha more than half of it, is fueled by this war on drugs. So for Uruguay to, to broach the idea of full legalization in a country is, is like that moment when the, the boy in the story points and says the emperor wears no clothes. It becomes a reality. It becomes something that the United States can't ignore. And it's my prediction within the next decade, by 2020, we will, we will see some level of decriminalization on a national scale for cannabis in this country. Hi, my name is Jan. I have a question. Um, going a little back, you are talking about three years old girl who is taken for the epilepsy, um, um, very low THC and very high CBD thing. Who, my question is, who do you have to be? Like, what kind of a grower, institution, company, or who do you have to be? to develop your own seeds and play with this, how many percentage of CBD, of THC and this, and make your own seeds, I mean, that you are allowed legally to make a research on that things. That's a very good question. Um, the development of these high, CB, high CBD strains has been a fairly recent development, and it's only been possible because of these medical cannabis laws. Uh, before medical cannabis, of course, the market in cannabis was the black market, was people who were looking for fun, people who were looking to get high. And the market forces then led to cannabis being bred that had more THC in it. And it's just like what happened during our alcohol prohibition. Before our alcohol prohibition, Americans pretty much drank uh, beer and cider. During alcohol prohibition, we drank whiskey. And the reason was, is if you only had a little bit of space in a Model T Ford to smuggle alcohol, were you going to smuggle a bunch of beer or were you going to smuggle a bunch of whiskey that you can get more money off of? Similarly, with prohibition in the United States, people who are growing marijuana, knowing that they're facing years or decades behind bars for doing so, want to grow the most potent, the most THC laden pot they can. They want, to, they want to sell to their customers the most powerful high they can get. Well, this is great as far as people who want THC, but for this little girl with the seizures who needs CBD, this has been a huge problem. In that most of the cannabis you find in our medical cannabis dispensaries in California or Colorado, where this little girl's from, are very high in THC and very low in CBD. But now that we have medical cannabis maturing in those states. I mean, California's had it for, what, 16, 17 years now. Uh, Colorado's had medical cannabis for 13 years. Now that these states have had some time to develop an industry, they've discovered that there is a need. There are some people, there's a small market for this high CBD cannabis. And a few growers have started to develop some of these strains. One is called Harlequin. Another one's called Charlotte's Web. Uh, some of these strains that are higher in CBD and lower in THC. As far as what is the legality of it, when you're in a medical cannabis state, most of the states have a designation uh, that that either, you know, specific, like here in my state of Oregon, there is a specific designation called a grower 
who is allowed to grow cannabis plants. In the other states, it's kind of implied. Uh, you're allowed to have cannabis plants, so go ahead and grow some. Uh, so long as you're covered in that medical cannabis state, under state law, you're allowed to breed and experiment. And uh, so long as you stay under the, the plant limit, you know, the total number of plants you're allowed to have, as long as you stay under that limit, you're, you're free to experiment, to crossbreed, hybridize, do whatever else you like. Of course, under federal law, it's all still illegal. It is illegal even when your constitution was first written on hemp paper. <laughs> oh, the irony. Yes, our, our federal constitution so, so was... Hemp paper uh, say it's illegal to have hemp. Yes. And you had the war on, when you had war, uh, from my uh, previous knowledge, you had, America had actually forced its farmers to grow hemp to win the war uh, for a better economy and sustainability of America. Mm -hmm. So, do you put the foundation of America when um, you have hemp paper constitution, but not hemp paper, uh, growers can have their own plant? I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it is, I've often said that hemp is our heritage. Our country was founded by hemp farmers, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington. Uh, these men grew great fields of hemp. The first hemp was planted in the American colonies in 1611. So it's been 200, 402 years since we first planted hemp on this continent. Our constitution, our declaration of independence originally drafted on hemp paper, our sailing ships, hemp sails, hemp ropes, and during World War II, as you mentioned, in World War II, even after we'd made marijuana illegal, we temporarily made hemp legal again because the Japanese cut off our supply of hemp from the Philippines, and so we needed hemp for victory, was what the thing was called. So yes, America, America making hemp illegal um, is like Britain making tea and crumpets illegal. <laughs> it just, it's, like, it's like India making cricket illegal. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my big question is how your country uh, can uh, 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 separate the criminals and um, okay, it's, it's like the law and uh, ill people which one use medical cannabis. Is this, uh, is some special work there or how this look out in your country? How how do we separate? I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand the question. Could you rephrase? If I am ill and I use medical cannabis and uh, some doctor take to me this and uh, somebody uh, which use this my medical in recreation for recreation, uh, is this uh, wrong in your country and how your country can regulate this? Okay, uh, well... If you're, in, if you're in one of the medical cannabis states, if you're in one of the 20 states, there's generally a procedure you have to go through before you're allowed to use the cannabis. Uh, generally, it means seeing a doctor who then writes you a recommendation. And in most of the states, you then take that recommendation to the state. You pay them a fee that can range anywhere from $40 to $200. And then the state will give you a card that is good for a year. And so long as you have that card, police are not supposed to arrest you or harass you over your cannabis use. If you're in one of the non-medical cannabis states and your doctor recommends cannabis and you're caught with it, you will go to jail. That's pretty much it. If I am ill and uh, I take medical cannabis uh, and recommendation in some another country of your states, uh, I am criminal and I go to jail. Yes. If you, for example, I, I believe, and I, I'm not perfect on my European Union knowledge, but I think in the European Union, you've got a couple of countries that recognize medical use. I believe the Netherlands is one. Uh, so if you were in the Netherlands and you got your recommendation from a doctor and you flew to the United States, uh, in any of the United States, you'd still be a criminal. As far as the medical cannabis laws go, most of the states don't even recognize the other states. For example, I'm in Oregon, and I have a medical cannabis card. But if I travel south to California, 
I'm illegal until I get my California card. If I travel to Washington, I'm illegal until I get my Washington card. In fact, there's only five states out of the 20, and those would be Arizona, Rhode Island, Maine, Michigan, and Delaware. Five of those 20 states are the only ones that will accept cards from other states. And I don't think they accept cards from other countries. I think it has to be other states, but I'm not entirely sure. What do activists and country do in this uh, case? W what can we do in this case? Yes. Uh, did, did, did be well, same, I, same I, in all your countries and uh, we wish uh, that uh, this will be legal in the whole, whole world. This is not a problem in the whole world if you are ill and you uh, can use medical cannabis or cannabis at all. Well, uh, uh, how you start to regulate it, or you do something, or how this look out in the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you're if you're a foreign national and you're using cannabis medically and you've got your doctor's recommendation, uh, when you get to the United States, you're just going to have to go through our procedures. You're going to have to see another doctor who's in the United States who will also recommend for you, and you're going to have to fill out the paperwork for that state and pay your fees and so on. How to change that? In the initiative-based country, uh, initiative-based states at least, we could put forth an initiative for what we call reciprocity, which just means accepting other cards. And that's been an idea for many of our uh, activists, because here in the United States, we have a little thing uh, called equal protection, which means when we travel from state to state, we should be treated the same. Like if I'm married in Oregon, I don't have to go get married again in Washington. Every state recognizes my marriage. Well, so long as it's a straight marriage. Let's not, you know, gay marriage is a whole other situation, but we won't go there for now. Uh, so basically, the states are supposed to respect other states' laws, but they don't when it comes to medical cannabis. So I think fighting for that reciprocity in the existing medical marijuana states is of paramount importance, at least until we can get you know, nationwide legalization. Uh, one more question from India. Okay. Uh, the law in federal states is different when you compare to uh, your uh, law in America. And the law for United Nations is different for uh, several uh, uh, different countries. But uh, to pass a resolution in the United Nations, you just need three countries to approve, to be able to present the bill on the floor. So what do you think will be um, your uh, status towards how we can put three countries together to bring a resolution for international law, which United Nations supports, because then it becomes a platform for every other country, EU, non-EU, to look at and um, go with it, because everybody is UN partner. Hmm. There, there is a sticking point in that idea, but I think it's a great idea. The sticking point is the 1961 United Nations Single Convention Treaty on Narcotic Drugs. Back in 1961, our uh, drug czar at the time, a man named Harry Anslinger, who was our drug czar from 1937 to 1962, uh, he pushed through the United Nations this treaty that most of the countries the, of the world have signed on to that very strictly regulates uh, drugs and how they may be produced, how they may be regulated, how they may be sold, and so forth. Uh, Uruguay, actually... It risks running afoul of this treaty in some way if they proceed with their legalization. So if we were to get three countries in the United Nations to sponsor some sort of resolution with respect to use of cannabis, uh, I believe they would have to they would have to craft it very carefully to make sure that it was in accordance with this 1961 treaty. Uh, I would prefer that the countries of the UN got together and changed that treaty uh, that would solve a whole lot of issues in the long run but that might be um, politically impossible in the short run so if we could get say the Netherlands Portugal and Uruguay to sponsor some sort of resolution uh, I would be for it I think those would be three countries that would make a lot of sense uh, hello from Slovenia also I have a question if you think that we can legalize marijuana how long do you think the pharmaceutical empire will last? Ooh. If, yeah. 
<laughs> if we can legalize marijuana, how long will the pharmaceutical empire last? Well, there are lots of drugs out there. I, I, I think, um, you know, nothing's going to make pharmaceutical companies go away. We'll still need people to manufacture, I don't know, antacids and uh, opiate painkillers and uh, SSRI mood inhibitors and so forth. I mean, cannabis isn't the miracle drug that's going to eliminate the use of all other drugs. That said, I think the, the pharmaceutical industry will probably lose 10 to 20% of its uh, market share uh, when people are able to substitute cannabis for such common things as sleeping pills and, you know, uh, aspirins and pain relievers and, and, uh, uh, the Pepto-Bismol and these other anti-nausea sorts of remedies. I think what we're going to see is a change because right now cannabis is kind of seen as a medicine of last resort. Like, okay, if you're dying and you've got cancer, then maybe we'll let you smoke pot. And I think what's going to happen is as more people discover, Hey, if I, if I smoke a little cannabis, I can get to sleep at night. Hey, if I smoke a little cannabis, my back pain goes away. When they discover it can be a medicine of first resort instead of turning to popping a pill, then I think we're going to see a huge uh, hit to the pharmaceutical industry's bottom line when people aren't buying bottles of Advil or Tylenol or, or Aleve every other month. So uh, will it kill the pharmaceutical industry? No, but I think it will severely hurt it. It's very hard to understand that uh, you uh, in the United States is uh, legal uh, medical cannabis and not uh, hemp. Uh, I, I must uh, congratulations to your uh, two countries this year. They free and it, uh, uh, everything if we understand right. Medical cannabis and uh, recreation uh, use of can can cannabis and hemp. How is this? Uh, can you uh, talk about uh, just a little bit about uh, actions uh, will be this uh, free and legal in all your country and uh, we, we share here just a little bit more about sure. this? Sure. Uh, the United States keeping industrial hemp illegal is has no logical basis whatsoever. Uh, I often like to point out that Every industrialized country in the world has legal industrial hemp, but still has illegal drug cannabis, right? Somehow, all of the police in Britain and Australia and Canada and China, somehow the police there can tell the difference between a tall, reedy hemp plant and a short, fat, bushy cannabis plant. But our cops in the United States apparently aren't that smart. <laughs> apparently they can't tell the difference they don't even understand basic plant horticulture they'll even come out and say well we can't legalize hemp because then they'll hide pot in it not understanding that those two cultivars would cross breed and make lousy hemp and lousy pot right it's just the most insane illogical thing in our country that we still ban industrial hemp and it only comes from ignorance. It only comes from our drug warriors having absolute <laughs> hatred for cannabis in any form. So uh, I'm shocked, actually, that the United States hasn't gone further with legalization of industrial hemp. Now, with Washington State and Colorado legalizing marijuana for recreational uses, Colorado went further and actually uh, specifically legalized industrial hemp. There is a farmer in Colorado now who is growing a 60-acre plot of hemp uh, right now uh, in defiance of federal law. So um, I'm hopeful that hemp will take off in this country. Uh, part of the problem with getting it to take off is that farmers have to grow so much of it before it's viable, right? Mm -hmm. like, like nobody wants to plant two hemp plants. They want to plant 2,000 hemp plants. They want to plant 20,000 hemp plants. And the problem with that is in the United States, our drug laws get more severe based on plant numbers. Once you go over 100, that's five years mandatory minimum sentence in a federal prison. Once you go over 500 plants, that's 10 years mandatory prison sentence. So, and, and they don't care if it's hemp or if it's cannabis. So very few farmers want to risk growing 
a real hemp farm when it could mean 10, 20 years in prison. Even when you have your first Ford TT, a Ford car coming uh, made out of hemp and driven on hemp fuel, uh, hasn't American science and technology progressed for so many years to make fuel from uh, plants rather than uh, from digging a hole in Mother Earth? Yes. Yes, it's sickening, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, it is. It's, it, you know, when you know so much about uh, what hemp can do, uh, and I'm sure over this uh, this conference you've had many, many experts. One of the things that uh, uh, appeals to me is building materials, this hempcrete that they've created. Uh, we have a, a company that were, has built an entire house in North Carolina, one of our states, uh, built an entire house out of this hempcrete, which is biodegradable, which is carbon neutral. Actually, it's carbon negative. It takes carbon dioxide out of the air. Uh, it's recyclable, it's insulated, it's cheap, it's strong, it's everything you want in a building material, uh, but it comes from hemp, so we can't have it. And, and, and when you learn about hemp seed oil and how, we, how any diesel engine in this country can run on hemp seed oil complete, with no modifications, and to think of all of the big tractor-trailer trucks all of these big trucks that are going across America day after day, shipping all these goods, polluting our atmosphere, if they were running on hemp seed oil, they'd be carbon neutral. The amount of carbon they'd be putting in the atmosphere would be equal to the amount of carbon the hemp plants took out of the atmosphere. But we can't have it because it looks like pot. When you start to learn these things, it, it, it almost, I'm not going to say it makes me ashamed to be an American, but it makes me ashamed of some of the people that are running this country. I'll tell you that. Well, you're welcome to India anytime. Well, I would, I would love to go to India. I would love to travel. You know, I've got a passport. It has no stamps on it yet, but uh, uh, I've been to 18 American states promoting marijuana legalization, and I'm very eager to get some stamps on my passport to promote legalization across the across the planet. So thank you. Uh, one more question about the economy uh, in this time when you legalize uh, when it's legal hemp and when it's cannabis in two countries and anywhere where in your country. Uh, uh, what is the look of economy? Is something new uh, about taxes? Maybe something? Uh, uh, how look out in your country? This what, what is? Well, uh, the economic value of legalizing marijuana should be pretty obvious, uh, especially as we look at just the effect that medical cannabis has had in the 20 states that have it. The jobs that have been created for people that are growing, for people that are working at these dispensaries, uh, the tax revenue that has been brought in to some of these cities and some of these states thanks to their legalization of just medical cannabis. In Colorado, uh, they're talking about uh, raising millions and millions of dollars from their recreational marijuana, which they're going to have taxation on. In Washington state, they're going to tax marijuana at 25% three times, from wholesale to retail to consumer. They're going to have three different taxes of 25% on this, plus a 6.5% state sales tax. So from an economic point of view, uh, especially in America where a lot of our manufacturing base, a lot of our factory jobs have gone overseas to Malaysia, to Mexico, to China, it's becoming almost an economic imperative to legalize marijuana. And in fact, the economic argument has been one of the strongest positive arguments we've had when we look at the polling of how people voted on the marijuana issue, the ability to raise tax revenue off of it has been quite a compelling part of this issue. So yes, uh, from an economic point of view, the, the, the pressure now to create American jobs and to bring in tax revenue to our struggling states has become quite a motivating factor in the legalization fight. Some percentage percent of uh Overall, Texas, overall uh, uh, country uh, economy in this, with some view from before? Is this... Uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand you. Say again. Is 
some percent, uh, how many uh, take money inside your country in percent maybe, how many much more with a new economy, hemp new economy till this year? What, what would the percentage be of our economy? Is that the question? If we pay taxes, when we uh, made it hemp economy, oh, oh okay. In your country, uh, how high is this uh, percent of? How high is the percentage of taxation? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, it depends. It depends on the state. Like I mentioned in uh, in Washington State, they're going to be doing twenty five percent taxation at three levels. In Colorado, I believe the taxation is fifteen percent. <laughs> And then each city can come up with its own additional tax rate. Uh, the largest city, Denver, has just uh, decided on 3.5% tax rate. In other medical cannabis states, uh, cannabis isn't taxed. Uh, for example, Washington State, just north of me, they do not have a tax on medical cannabis, but they are going to have a tax on recreational cannabis. And this has caused kind of a conflict because some people believe that since there'll be no tax for medical users, some recreational users will try to fake being medical so they can get the tax break. Uh, in California, the largest state with medical cannabis, tax rates vary uh, because California doesn't really do its medical cannabis on a statewide basis. They do it county by county. And there's something like 66 counties in California. Each county will have its own tax rates if that county allows medical cannabis sales at all there are some counties in california and some cities in california that have banned the sales of medical cannabis but in places like oakland california which is in the bay area uh taxes are around six to ten percent i believe and in other states i don't have a whole lot of their tax rate information for you Thank you very much, Mr. Arch. Uh, we, we don't have a uh, question. Oh, we have uh, questions. There's a lot of questions uh, for you. Can we take you? You have time for us? Uh, for uh, I, I can take one more question. I, have to, uh, I do have to get moving to my uh, work. All right. Um, when we talk about carbon credits, I think the uh, United Nations is leading the whole uh, UN resolution and awareness that every country needs to be carbon neutral and other things. What do you think about the people who grow uh, hemp and that uh, is actually regulating carbon? So do we not have, should be actually paying them something rather than taking tax on them? Should be is the question, should we be paying them rather than taxing them? Yes, because the plant growers who already are growing medical or non-medical hemp are actually benefiting the carbon uh, emission and carbon control. So do you not think that we should actually be paying the farmers uh, so that they can uh, grow better and grow more? In a just world, yes. Mm -hmm. If, if we were doing things right, we would be paying farmers to come up with better cultivars of cannabis, better cultivars of hemp. It would be in our national interest. It would be, it would be a benefit to all mankind for us to find better varieties of hemp. But unfortunately, the way the United States has prohibited it, it's pretty much in the realm, for most people, it's in the realm of shadows. It's in the realm of black market illegality. And for the few of us that are in the medical cannabis states, we're still in the realm of being highly regulated and heavily uh, watched. Uh, so uh, I agree. I think we ought to be paying our growers. But for right now, uh, the pay that the growers make is being able to charge people extremely high prices for cannabis thanks to prohibition. They, they do make their money. Okay. We will end it, uh, this uh, uh, interview. Uh, we are very, very, very proud that we can see you and hear you here in Slovenia. And um, uh, stay with us. Uh, and thank you very, very, very much, Mr. Rush. And thank you very much, United States. Bye. And see you next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I apologize. I apologize. I wasn't able to speak to you on Monday on hemp. I'm, I'm still just getting over a very severe uh, illness. Uh, and Monday I was pretty sick. So I don't know if I would have been very good anyway. So thank you for inviting me. And I, I, and I hope.
<laughs> I hope next time that we do this, I'm able to appear in person in Slovenia. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone.